Diving into your next act or wondering what's ahead? Enjoy life as you change your path and embrace your authentic self. Join me as we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of making big changes in your life. New directions both personally and professionally shake things up. But don't worry, you are not alone. On each episode, we'll be sharing stories, providing valuable information, and introducing you to others navigating their next act. So let's get inspired. This is a Candy Factory Convo, Life in the Next Act with Gail Shane. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life in the Next Act. Today, we are going to talk with Amy Banks, Arts Communication Manager at Millersville University, co-owner and band leader at Robin Banks Entertainment, which produces regionally based Central City Orchestra and an entrepreneur at heart. Amy will be discussing the entertainment world, taking risks, and being a yes to life. With stops around the world appearing on stage and screen, Amy now calls Lancaster, Pennsylvania home. She juggles many of her talents with a commitment to bringing joy and vitality while connecting the community through entertainment. Hello, Amy, and welcome. Well, hello, Gail. That was such a nice introduction. <laughs> You're a nice gal. Why, thank you. How are you tonight? Great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Amy, you are an entrepreneur at heart. Many people struggle with the idea that you can't be successful doing what you love. But you have accomplished that in the entertainment world for over three decades. Can you please take us on your journey from Atlanta, Georgia, where your career began until now? Oh, Lord, I thought this was only a 30-minute show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I was very fortunate, I think, in ending up in entertainment. I, I like to say I was a victim of my career. I just kept getting really awesome, awesome opportunities and well, I didn't have anything better to do, so I said, sure. And uh, I'm from Minnesota originally, uh, so I wound up leaving in the late 80s to start to uh, take my first job in a band. And it kind of went from there. But, uh, you know, I would say my whole, my whole adult career has been uh, about being a yes and seeing an opportunity that sounded interesting and fun and, uh, and just taking it. So, you know, in Atlanta, I was uh, in a band called Larry Whitaker and Spellbound. And uh, I was there for about nine years, uh, where I started to do um, stage theater plays in the late 90s. And um, yeah, let me think. I wound up in New York auditioning at some po point near the, the late 90s and ended up getting hired by Disney World to open the brand new Animal Kingdom theme park where I opened uh, Festival of the Lion King wow. theme park show, not the Lion King National Broadway Tour or anything like that or that one. Uh, but that show did wind up being, uh, being the number one theme park show in the world for over 10 years. So I'm like, I did that. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it went from there. Uh, once I had a taste of working full time, being fully supported by singing for thousands of people every day, uh, there, was, there was no turning back. There's no going back to the office. So, uh, so it just went from there, um, auditioning and saying yes. And I wind up uh, in the early 2000s taking a job at American Music Theater at... Uh, right here on Lancaster. Yes, I say it right now, Lancaster. And uh, I decided to stay. I was, um, I was one of those people who uh, was quick to run. And when my contract ended with, uh, with American Music Theater in 2005, my impulse was to pick up and run. But, uh, but some force greater than me suggested that it was time to stop running and to deal with the circumstances at hand. And uh, I owned a home here and I had started uh, 
growing a fan base thanks to American Music Theater. And so next thing you know, I'm, I'm supporting myself as a jazz singer right here in Central PA. Uh, and then I, oddly enough, uh, I don't know if any of you can relate to this idea. Uh, sometimes when we make mistakes or we see things going one way that we wish they hadn't gone that way, like you get fired from a job at Disney World, uh, <laughs> or you're not offered another contract. Right. Um, you know, you look back and think, well, what, what could I have done differently to not have this circumstance end up this way? And as it turns out, I got that opportunity. I got to go back to Disney World and, uh, and reprise the roles that I had opened. I, it was six years after I had left Disney World that I went back. Never happens. I don't, I don't know how that happened. I got to be a model employee and hang out there for a while. And then I came, I wound up coming back to Lancaster. I mean, I still had my house here and everything. I was temporarily living in Florida for about a year. Uh, but I came back to Lancaster because American Music Theater gave me a do-over too. Two so, do-overs. Right, right. So who does that? So if any of you can relate and you're fortunate enough to have do-overs, I had too, which also was another unique element of my career, which was I'm mostly terrified of auditioning. So I basically just recycled jobs, which is like unheard of. <laughs> it's recycle jobs. And then, of course, there are other elements. Um, you know, when you're smart in entertainment, you uh, maximize your revenue streams which is probably the entrepreneur in me more than anything. But uh, of course I was a model and uh, an actress and I did voiceovers and gosh, what else? Oh, I was a TV personality. <laughs> I did a couple TV shows back when reality TV was a big deal. As it's I had, still a big deal. <laughs> well, yeah, only it's not really reality anymore. They tell you exactly what to do and who to sleep with. But back when I was doing it, I, I mentioned this earlier, you know, I'm I'm not a I'm not an interior designer, but I played one on TV. Cool. So I got to uh deliver the giant Christmas present of a surprise make uh room makeovers in a show called Design Invasion. And then I did some other little thing for HGTV that was mostly me telling jokes about tubs. Um so it's so it's been interesting. I say all that to say that uh you know, I was able to parcel a lot of things together and make it work. And I never got evicted. And I, you know, all the scary things that people think when, uh, particularly in embarking in entertainment, but certainly in embarking on anything that you consider a dream that feels a little risky. You know, you have these, these big fears, the potential of the worst case scenario. And in almost any circumstance, I think we can all look back and realize that even in our wildest fears, the worst case scenario rarely happens. And so I was fortunate enough that uh, I was always able to support myself and to eat plenty. And, uh, <laughs> and I have managed, you know, to, to do well. And well, uh, it, it sounds like you've always had a backup plan. And uh, you, you thought of retiring from entertainment which did not happen. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're forming Robin Banks Entertainment. Tell us how that came about. Well, uh, I was thinking of retiring because in 2016, I was hired by Millersville University to work as their arts communication manager. And I wanted to establish myself. I wanted to, to establish credibility as a, as a marketer and communications person. And I felt like I couldn't be a singer. I was afraid that I was going to always be, oh, you're that singer, blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah, but this is what I really do. Uh, and needless to say, it didn't matter because I was still always that, that singer. And uh, consequently, um, when uh, my today current business partner, Katie Robinette, uh, approached me and uh, was, was thinking about starting her own band, um, it was sort of like, whoa, yeah, heck yeah, <laughs> why not? 
Um, I had been in a wedding band out of Philadelphia for about seven years, and it was run horribly. So uh, I knew all the ways that I would have run the band had it been mine. And consequently, uh, two, three months after I started with Millersville University, we started Central City Orchestra, which is a 10-piece uh, band with three vocals up front and horns. And, uh, well, we never looked back. <laughs> so I, uh, needless to say, did not leave singing. And in fact, I've done several concerts at Millersville University, uh, at the Ware Center, downtown Lancaster. Um, and so I'm still the, the <laughs> I get this sometimes, it's so weird, because, you know, I'm not famous by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I still get the, are you the Amy, are you the, are you the Amy Banks? <laughs> I bought something off a of Facebook marketplace and I went out to some suburb I didn't even know existed. And I pull up and here's a lady, probably my mom's age, and she's like, I thought it might be you. I was like, oh my gosh. Well. She thought it might be the Amy Banks and here she was. The Amy Banks is picking up her ottoman. You're famous to us, Amy. Let, oh, let me sorry. ask you this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, you know, you're, you're, you're a fabulous talent. And, uh, and I get how you feel. So I want to ask you about your mindset. Mm. The okay. mindset of being a yes to life. What were some of the risks you had to take? Uh, maybe that you thought you were too old to do, or you were afraid to do, and you just decided to say yes. Well, I will say, I'll start with Millersville University, actually, because uh, I had not, prior to 2016, I had not had a job since 1997. I'd been in entertainment the entire time, and uh, I was terrified at the idea that I might actually be able to get this job. Um, and I was 49. So I know that's not really like that old, but when I'm looking at a career change after having been an entrepreneur working for myself really for all intents and purposes for 25 years, I was like, nobody's gonna hire me in a new industry per se at 49. And, uh, and yeah, I was wrong, fortunately. Um, there was one point in my career, excuse me, where uh, I had gotten an inquiry on the internet. It was 2012, it wasn't that long ago, but uh, I had gotten an email from a very nice person with some broken English. And they said, well, we have a jazz club in Moscow, would you like to come? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> yes, we, uh, we wanna have you sing at our club in, in Moscow and uh, we're gonna, take care of you and put you in this nice hotel and pay for your get your visa and pay for you to come over and how much money do you need and ba 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 and you know, for, the first thing I'm thinking is what are these people doing are they gonna sell me into white slavery <laughs> <laughs> which would be weird but um <laughs> you know like like who who in their right mind says yes to a random inquiry on the internet. But I did my homework and I checked it out and as it, I said, well, of course, how could I pass up this opportunity? And I wound up in Moscow in the freezing, bitter cold of February by myself uh, with perfectly lovely people. They, uh, they sold out both shows. They paid me in advance before I even got on the plane. Wow. Um, I had a handler who was with me at all times. And, um, and they even gave me Russian vodka. You know what it was? What? Smeared off. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an amazing experience. I sold a bunch of CDs and, you know, really in the back of my head, I was like, this is insane. I can't believe I'm doing this. And it was perfectly fine. It was an amazing experience. So, uh, you never really know when, uh, you know, it's it's so easy to be afraid, and I think we kind of have a a culture and a society that uh, that fans the flames of fear. 
So it's really easy, again, to imagine the worst case scenarios or to, to doubt yourself in terms of your ability or to question people who believe in you. <laughs> but uh, but you, you never really know until you have the guts yeah. to, to challenge, to challenge the, the, the doubts and the, yeah, to challenge the doubts and the questions of being good enough. If you do that, I think that everyone will find that even if it doesn't turn out the way they think, the way, even if it didn't turn out the way I thought it should have, uh, that I either learned something or had an amazing experience anyway. So. Sure. Why not? And and talking about the the people that um, admire you or believe in you, your parents were your parents in the entertainment world. Uh, no, no, my folks weren't. They were music education majors. My mom was a teacher for a short period of time before becoming a mom, I think. And my father was also a teacher before he wound up working for the National Education Association. Excuse me, I'm going to cough, excuse me. <coughs> Where he retired at 57. Now, now my father, though, he, I guess you could say he's kind of a, uh, kind of a yes to life because um, at 57, all right, I got to tell you the story. All right, my dad, Joe Banks, look him up, look him up on Facebook. I think he has like seven profiles. He doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, my dad, who just turned 79, he retired at 57 and he's at a bar. And from across the bar, a couple of guys approach him. And they're like, hey, you have a really interesting look. Have you ever considered modeling? Like, right, no, like, you know, like the same story that you hear about the little teenage girls in the mall. <laughs> this is in Minnesota. This is in Minnesota where he lives. You know, like the girls getting approached at the mall and being, being you know, given a bunch of uh, compliments and told that they'd be famous models or that they'd be great models. And, you know, it always sounds like, oh, Sam, here's my old ass dad sitting at a bar. <laughs> and some guys approach him. Well, they were photographers. They took his picture. And... He started modeling, <laughs> which That's I just awesome. think is ridiculous. Yeah, he'd always call me up and be like, I had this audition and it, it went awful. I'd be like, Dad, you're not the judge. You don't get to judge whether it was awful. It was awful. I was awful. And then he'd call me back like the next day. Hey, you won't believe this. I got the job. I'm like, oh, Lord, Dad, yes. And one year, I swear that man made more money than I ever did my entire career. He has a very distinct look. He's a dark-skinned black man with silver hair. He's uh, he's rather handsome. In fact, I've been told I got my looks from him. He's adorable. <laughs> yes, yeah, You'll man. find him on Facebook. Find him on Facebook. Um, so while they weren't necessarily in entertainment, my dad, uh, actually, even just last year, my dad uh, was in a movie in the Twin Cities. Um, we both just watched it recently and he texted me, he's like, oh God, I hope those people aren't listening. It was awful. He said, it was an awful movie. Like, oh no, dad, it was fun. You were great. You were, I said, you were so cute. So at 78, my dad, oh, my dad did two things that I'd love to talk about. Uh, in addition to the film, he also recorded a song on YouTube. I wish I'd given Anne this link promo my dad get him a big record contract he'd written this song it came from his heart it was called take care and he recorded it while playing ukulele he's got kind of a nice voice and it was such a big project for him and he'd never done anything like that before and he really just like bared his soul and uh and played this and i kept trying to tell him dad you know you got like over three thousand views i've had I've had videos up on, on YouTube for years and like only three people have watched them. Like, man, this is really awesome. He's adorable. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Maybe I got a little bit of that spirit from him. Maybe. I, just, I think he was, uh, he just took a while to let it come out. I want to, I want to take you back to June 18th, 2015, live at the Ware Center in Lancaster. 
<laughs> Amy sings Aretha, a Motown love story. You invite the audience on stage to sing Respect. Whoop. Yours truly jumps on stage Whoop. and sings along with the backup singers. Whoop. What Whoop. fun that was. <laughs> I'm on one of your music CDs. You you definitely are. And I think you actually sounded like that. Whoop, whoop. No, I was much better. Okay. So I think you're right. Yeah, you I were. was. I was much yeah. better. Well, that's what you told me. Anyway, with, with five music CDs produced in your career, I'm on one. Reel it in, Amy. On Reel it in. Appearing on stage <laughs> and screen all over the world, including Moscow. Please tell us. What has been your proudest accomplishment in the entertainment world? Hmm. You know, every time I did something else, yeah, I, I look back and I think I never worked for theme parks until I worked for Disney World, which is, you know, like the best theme park in the world. And I had a great job working in American Music Theater. Um, you know, even the Moscow opportunity was, was interesting. And, but I tell you what. The Aretha Project was kind of special, really? but here's why. Uh, I had just always wanted to sing. This was prior to our band, to having the band, but I always wanted to sing with a horn band. And, you know, in jazz, you're not doing that because you're not getting paid enough to hire horns, right? You might get to hire one, but certainly not a horn line and uh, or a horn section. And, you know, I'm certainly not, no Aretha Franklin. She, she was such an amazing singer and uh you know with that amazing gospel background that i don't have but uh but i thought about this concept i thought it was amazing it was going to be an opportunity for me to sit to sing with a horn band so uh harvey harvey owen who was the director of the wear center at the time had had booked me to do a cabaret which would typically be like me in a in a piano or a small combo telling sad stories drinking wine acting foolish. Um, but I decided, you know what, I want to have a 10 piece band. How am I going to be able to afford that? And I decided, well, here's how I afford it. Uh, we move it to the big theater downstairs. And I make a live recording out of it. So I can uh, do a Kickstarter campaign to raise the money to do the live recording. And then I can afford to pay all the musicians. And then I get to have my horn band on stage and I'll sell out the auditorium so everybody makes some money and, um, and we're good. So I put this elaborate plan together where I uh, recorded about five of the videos. You can find those on YouTube, five different songs from the show we recorded in advance. And I used those as marketing tools from a Kickstarter campaign and went on to, uh, to lean on my fan base and uh, we raised $12,000 so I could record this project and get to sing with my horn band. So I thought personally that was brilliant. <laughs> and I was really proud and excited about the idea that, that I wanted to do this. So I figured out how to do it and I enrolled the people around me who had to say yes. Um, at the time, Laura Kendall had just come on a, as the director of uh, visual and performing arts for the, for Millersville University, and she didn't even know me. And I just came to her and said, nah, I don't really want to do a little cabaret. I want to do a concert dance party, and I want to record it live, and I want to take it downstairs. What do you think? She's like, oh, yeah, that sounds terrific. And uh, and she said yes. And uh, I... I I feel proudest about the idea of having a spark and catching on fire and deciding this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to do it. And then just like, like, like doing it, like talking everybody else into it and, and making it happen. So well, I would say I, that is my proudest. I, yeah. Moment. And I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of that proud moment. I didn't know that. I just brought that one concert up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I'm super glad to be a part of, of that proud moment. And you, you, you now juggle, you juggle all this talent. Uh, you know, I try to see you whenever you sing. I haven't made every single act, but you juggle all this talent. 
and you, you're at Millersville University. Tell us what you do there and tell us what your greatest achievement has been at Millersville University. Huh. I just answered this question earlier. So at Millersville, I am the arts communication manager, which ultimately means that I uh, just promote and publicize the arts events that are taking place at the Ware Center and the Winter Center on the Millersville University campus. Um, it's It's been a wonderful opportunity for me. The way I see it, I uh, I get to help get artists paid. And I also get to help deliver uh, an amazing experience uh, for the people of Lancaster. And uh, particularly in the past couple of years with uh, the new director, Robin Zaremski, uh at the helm, she's really, brought, she's really leveled up uh, what we're offering there. So, so that is truly true. And I do believe that, that uh, the arts at Millersville is, is the Lancaster County's home for the cultural arts. Um, and so I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of that. Uh, the thing that I'm, I think I'm most proud of is that I also uh, curate and uh, host the jazz series, which is Club 42. And in fact, I tell people, did you know that uh, Lancaster has a jazz club? Because we set the atrium up on the second floor, the third floor of uh, the Ware Center, like a club. There's bar, and uh, we ask people to be quiet while they're watching the show, but you can socialize and have some drinks and some food and uh, watch amazing talent. I bring a lot of – so I get to s decide how that goes. Uh, it's my budget, and I get to bring down a lot of emerging and uh, young talent from New York generally because they're hungry and they want to come down and – and uh, and I, I've really grown that series. I I see new people coming through the doors every time I host a show. Uh, we've even done a couple now. We're just we're mostly presenting on live stream, but the live streams are free, so you can even go. At the which arts is at, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The arts at Millersville. Um, we've got um, we've got a show coming up March twentieth. In fact, uh, Three Divas Jazz Trio. Uh, are coming coming up from DC to uh, to perform, and that's free. So I, I'm very proud. I feel like uh, I've been able to elevate the the jazz conversation in Lancaster and enroll folks into hearing hearing unique and interesting and new music. Uh, one in particular, Edmar Castaneda, is a jazz harpist. I will never forget him. He brought his wife, who is a singer. And she sings these traditional, um, I can't remember what, oh, they're from Colombia, Colombian folk songs. And he plays this amazing electronic harp. I'd never seen anything like it. But uh, I, I get to do that. I get to bring that kind of thing to Lancaster. And, uh, and I love it. And people seem to love it too because they keep coming back and new people keep coming every show. And hopefully when we're out of this pandemic, that uh, people will come back and will enjoy live music together again. Well, we all have certainly enjoyed that great achievement with, with the Jazz Club and, and what you have created. I've seen um, you there a couple of times, yeah. I, I love it. I mean, you know, the, the music scene in Lancaster, Pennsylvania is over the top. And um, I want to ask you, with your yes to life attitude, what is next for you who oh, what's next well i'd tell you but i'd have to kill you um <laughs> that's not the right answer for this kind of show is it <laughs> uh what's next i don't know any you know? dreams of um uh, writing <laughs> i there's a lot of things that feel like I should have done or I wish I had done or I wish I were better at and writing is one of those things that keeps coming up um, I that comes up for a lot of people that's why I mentioned it but yeah well well you know a lot of those people are generally generally writing whereas me on the other hand I'm actually not writing at all uh, just thinking I should be writing uh, but it is this gnawing, nagging thing back here uh, in the back of my mind I feel like I must have something 
something worth sharing and I just have to uh, muster up the courage to, uh, to put pen to paper. And you probably will. I probably will. Let me ask you this. Um, how do you give back to the community and what nonprofits are near and dear to you? Well, you know, Lancaster, I love and I love music. So I've been and I love the arts. So I've been fortunate enough to uh, be involved with the Lancaster Creative Factory, which is uh, Kevin Lehman. He's a potter and he has a, an organization that provides education and in, in he works a lot with young people in the arts. And uh, I also had been on the board of Central Pennsylvania Friends of Jazz forever. It felt like forever. It's been a long time now since I was. I was president at one point. But, uh, you know, jazz presenters need to su support one another. And I had always felt that way. And I'd, and I'd you know, gotten a nice, a nice fan base from, from Central PA Friends of Jazz. Uh, but also music for everyone here in town, uh, John and, and Brendan are doing such a fine job really uh, helping support music educators and education in schools and all kinds of fun things that they do. They're, they're just great people. So, you know, I was able to produce a concert a couple summers ago as a fundraiser for them. And uh, every opportunity I get, if I can raise some money for music for everyone, I like to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your your journey. Thank, thank you for sharing me. your your love of of music and and the arts and sharing it with our community. It's very special. You can reach Amy at amybanksonline.com or email amy at amybanksonline.com. I'd like to leave you with this. Attract what you expect. Reflect what you desire. Become who you respect. Mirror what you admire. Join us next time as we aim to inspire, empower, and inform. Life in the Next Act is a proud member of the Candy Factory Collective. You can find the show streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and LinkedIn. And you could subscribe to the audio version anywhere you get your podcasts. Gail has experienced many acts over the years. Living a full life, she is a mother of two and grandmother of three, and currently calls Lancaster PA home. An entrepreneur at heart, she's owned several businesses, hosted a popular radio show, and has written for prominent publications highlighting nonprofits. While she holds her real estate license in Florida and PA, she believes her true calling is giving others a voice. Learn more about Gail at gailshane.com. Life in the Next Act is produced by the Candy Factory Collective at the Candy Factory Coworking Campus in Lancaster, PA. Production support by Jason Mundock and Anna Tran. Administrative support by Ann Kirby, Ariana Henderson, and Krisha Martzel. Notes and links can be found on the show post at our website, candyfactorycollective.com. Candy Factory. Collective.